thank you madam uh, so good afternoon one and all i'll be covering a certain few complications in lvc over the next uh, 10 minutes so complications in lvc usually is probably a part of a miscalculated risk some red flag signs which we've overlooked either intraoperatively or postoperatively leading on to these issues so i'll just quickly cover some intraop issues first uh, primarily initially starting with the docking and placement of the uh, laser itself so in case you have a slightly decentered dock uh, can i have the mouse which is working please so uh, in a decentered dock either in both in microkeratome as well as in femto laser you can actually have these kind of decentered flaps which are partly uh, very close to the visual axis if they are very close to the visual axis it's best to completely avoid any kind of treatment uh, and then uh, subsequently uh, do the do a surface ablation at a later date but if you have a sufficient about 2 to 3 mm clearance from the visual axis you can actually go ahead and uh, complete the laser treatment as well uh, there are on occasions when especially with the femto laser both in smile as well as in femto lasik where you may have excessive uh, obl which is uh, ca causing uh, a higher which can be either because of a higher femto energy delivery if you haven't optimized your parameters or prior to your dock if you've had a fairly dry surface so it's important to have not excessive pooling of fluid but a thin tear film before you dock a patient for a femto laser either in smile or femto lasik otherwise your uh, laser delivery might be quite poor leading on to such difficult dissections now subsequent to docking and placement we have issues with ring sizing with the microkeratome uh, which can lead to consequent disasters like buttonhole and free flap so for a steep cornea like this you should always anticipate the possibility of having a buttonhole as you can see here there is a small focal area which has got a buttonhole and if it's such closely to the visual axis is best not to raise the flap just uh, uh, reposit it back place a bcl allow it to heal and then at a subsequent date do a surface ablation procedure and not proceed with the treatment now with these flat corneas you can lead up with this nightmarish situation of having a free flap as in such a case it's always always uh, preferable to mark the cornea prior to doing a, a microkeratome flap even though this complication might be one in 2000 but uh, when are you, when you are faced with such a complication it's preferable to have these marks which can really help in uh, subsequent placement of the flap and place a contact lens suturing rarely may be required uh, it's a, a careful preoperative examination is invaluable in such eyes which have subtle scars which may be missed. The laser can actually track through these uh, subtle scars and come to the anterior surface leading on uh, to this vertical gas breakthrough which in a sense basically causes a buttonhole. If it is so peripheral you could still go ahead lift the flap do the laser ablation and put it back without any major consequences. But if this is somewhere towards the center uh, we should watch out and probably not even lift the flap. Suction breaks are definitely issues with uh, any femto laser. Uh, you could have pseudo suction in microkeratome as well which can lead to greater disasters like these partial flaps, incomplete flaps or inadequate flaps all of which are cases where you have to just abandon the procedure and uh, not go ahead with any treatment whatsoever and just uh, live to fight another day and do a, a surface ablation procedure at a later date. But however, in a femtosecond laser, it gives you a second chance where a double pass can actually be made. Even after the suction loss has occurred, you could go ahead and just reduce the flap diameter by about 0.5 millimeters so that you can ensure adequate centration. And you could even go ahead with the side cut only approach uh, if your uh, previous uh, uh, cut has uh, completed. A side cut only approach might be sufficient to ensure that you can lift the flap and go ahead with successful ablation. Suction, uh, suction loss in smile, however, is a completely different challenge and uh, at various stages has to be managed adequately. Now in this, during the lenticule, that is the posterior cut itself, if you've had a suction loss, you have no other choice but to redock and go ahead uh, with a femtolasic uh, and uh, create the, basically convert it into a flap-based procedure. But if you have managed to complete the posterior cut and the suction loss happens during the side cut, Sorry, it's not. Yeah, and it happens either during the side cut or the cap cut. Uh, 
then it is actually possible to proceed again with a smile. But in this case, it's very important to ensure that you have adequate centration during your uh, subsequent dock so that it is centered or similarly centered as it was during your previous dock. You would do well to uh, in, uh, change the diameter by 0.2 to 0.4 if uh, your suction loss has happened during the cap cut. And uh, yes, we have to watch out that your subsequent dissection of the lenticule can be a little more challenging and careful dissection is required to ensure that the lenticule has been removed in total. Post-operative issues. Uh, Microstria are very common, especially in uh, deeper, larger, uh, higher myopic ablations, and usually a conservative approach is sufficient, but rarely if the microstria are in the visual axis and causing any decline in the uh, BCBA, then it is uh, you could go ahead and uh, hydrate and reposit the flap, and that usually takes care of the microstria. Macrostria are, on the other hand, require immediate attention. And uh, it's usually just floating and stretching them may not be sufficient. The epithelium is causing a puckering effect over the flap. And so careful debridement of the epithelium, then hydrating it and putting it back and uh, ironing out the flap in a direction perpendicular to the direction of the striae is essential and then subsequently hydrate it and put it back. A small degree of PTK can also be done if you are uh, worried about manually debriding the epithelium, the PTK itself without causing any damage to the underlying flap can help in removing the epithelium and the puckering effect is relieved which can subsequently help in uh, uh, treating the ma macrofolds. Epithelial ingrowths though rare, especially after a retreatment or if you've had a flap related complication can occur and uh, they can really when they advance lead to disastrous complications like flap melts and uh, decline in vision. So need to be managed early and adequately if they are progressive. So uh, at the edge, you could just lift the flap edge alone and uh, cause, uh, debride both the undersurface and the posterior surface of the flap, including a little bit debridement of the epithelium just beyond the flap edge is also useful to prevent recurrence of the uh, epithelial ingrowth. And uh, to prevent any uh, excessive haze or scarring, which is quite common, subsequent to uh, debridement of these epithelial ingrowth, you could mitigate it by applying some mitomycin C, both on the back surface of the flap as well as on the bed, and ensuring that uh, you're, you're minimizing the extent of fibroblastic activation which may occur subsequent to this procedure. In these rare situations where a patient had had a free flap and subsequently a very extensive uh, uh, you know, epithelial ingrowth where the flap is exceedingly unhealthy and uh, it's very difficult to retain the flap. In these kind of situations, where, though very rare, it's probably just best to amputate the flap. This, this particular patient had developed this after a subsequent trauma which had led to a flap displacement and the flap had been sutured but then developed a secondary epithelial ingrowth. So we were left with no choice but to just remove this unhealthy flap, uh, debride the surrounding epithelium and uh, the back surface, removing all the ingrowth, apply some mitomycin C again to reduce the extent of scarring. And you'll notice that it can be actually quite gratifying in these recurrent cases of epithelial ingrowth. And this was the picture of the patient three months post-operatively with a very small residual error had a completely clear cornea. And this is definitely possible to achieve uh, if you, uh, you know, uh, take the right precautions, apply mitomycin C for a sufficient period of time, preventing any haze from developing in these situations which can happen. DLK, again, uh, rarer with the newer, uh, uh, I mean, better instrumentation that we have today, but uh, can be a complication. It's important to di uh, diagnose uh, or rather differentiate DLK from a slightly lesser known entity, which is uh, CTK. So CTK is just basically a central toxic keratopathy, which can happen uh, anywhere between three to nine days, unlike DLK, which is usually within the immediate first uh, 24 to 48 hours itself. DLK is usually more diffuse, it's superficial, it involves the interface and the flap. CTK, in the previous video which I was showing was actually a case of CTK, where you saw even after lifting the flap, the deeper stroma also was involved. So that is uh, typically a case of CTK, which was misdiagnosed as DLK. CTK is non-inflammatory, is self-limiting, does not require uh, steroids or interface wash like DLK does. And usually over a period of weeks to months, it tends to resolve. However, you can have a hyperopic shift in both instances.
infection though rare can be a very major uh, problem and uh, uh, we need to treat them uh, aggressively in the early stage you need to scrape irrigate uh, culture them and even discard the flap wherever required i'll quickly finish off with one case of irregular topography this is again a patient with uh, epithelial ingrowth uh, who was managed with uh, debridement and mitomycin c but because of subsequent scarring had a irregular topography like this with this kind of residual hyperopic cylinder which the patient was quite uncomfortable with and you can see that there is a fair amount of asymmetry in the uh, topography itself so we went ahead with a topo guided ablation wherein you could see in the it's flattening the steeper area and over the higher uh, region where it was consequently flat there's almost no ablation and subsequent to it it's a much more regular cornea and uh, with an improved and a very minor residual cylinder which the patient was quite happy with glare and halos are also conditions which can be addressed with these topo guided abla ablations to enlarge the optical zone if it was a small optical zone to begin with uh, brimonidin adequate lubrication may also help so to conclude, meticulous case selection and appropriate introp measures can help us avert and as well as manage such disasters effectively. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you.